Well, it's a privilege to be here with four uh, diverse and terrific CEOs with a great view of what's going on in banking around the country. And uh, for the audience, please remember to submit your questions on Pigeonhole. Towards the end of the discussion, uh, we will go to questions that we have received from all of you. Let's start with uh, the macro picture uh, in the economy. It's probably worth pausing for a second and going back 10 years. In November 2008, the economy had suffered 10 straight months of job losses. Um, we are obviously in a very different macroeconomic picture right now. Brian, as you look at the national picture, uh, what do you feel good about and what concerns you? Well, we feel good that the it's clear that U.S. consumers continue to spend at a faster increase this year versus last year. At the end of the day, the U.S. consumer economy drives a lot of what goes on in the U.S. and, frankly, around the world, and so that's good news. And, and so as wage growth continues to move up, maybe not as fast as people might have theorized it should have, even though those of us employers see it growing fast, as employment levels are at all time, you know, strength generally, job formation is still very strong. Um, you're seeing, you know, consumers spend based on that, and it's very healthy. And then when you go to the commercial side, and we all, you know, have commercial uh, banking uh, uh, teammates are out there, it's very competitive, and, and the companies are very profitable. They are benefiting from the tax reform, which was needed, and they are continuing to, they're sort of in a growth mode, but they're also, this, the debate about when's, are we late cycle, end of cycle, is the cycle going to be longer than normal? This debate preoccupies people, and then you add to it some of the issues around uh, tariffs and trade and stuff like that. And so I think there's a nervousness of how that will all shake out. Mm -hmm. In the current statistics, numbers, delinquencies, credit, all that stuff, you don't, you don't see any impact of that, but that's the worry of the moment. Yeah. And we'll, it will see how it plays out. We're, we're pretty confident. Our, our team, our research team has the U.S. growing this year at just around 2.93% next year about 2.7 percent so it will slow down the question in their projections the question is that's still faster and it grew almost at a year in the last 10 years so that's that's the good news bad news if you want to write the book that's slowing down that's tr they project it to happen but if you want to write the book it's faster and it's been for a while you know that's good too so we feel very good about the, the near-term macro in the u.s great nandita why don't we go to you for uh, a view of the regional picture that you see with your footprint and customer base. Yeah, thank you, Kosik. Um, we are in the western part of the country, as you know, and we are seeing uh, tremendous growth. We're helped, of course, by the tech sector, uh, being in, headquartered in San Francisco, but states like Arizona, Washington, Utah, uh, Port, uh, you know, all those areas are doing really well. So we are pretty bullish also. And if you look at the trends, if you look at the major KPIs, whether it's cost of risk, uh, whether it is um, other uh, aspects like those, those are all trending really well. Having said that, we are con conscious of the fact that it's been a pretty long cycle. So uh, there, we are expecting a downturn, and we are um, gearing up for it. But so far, so good. Kelly, you, from your vantage point, anything you'd add? <clears throat> yeah, so we cover the uh, Mid-Atlantic and, and Southeast. Uh, primarily, and I would say overall the economy is good. Consumer confidence is very high, business confidence is very high. You know, when I travel around all of our regions and sit down for lunches and talk about how things are going, um, there's an awful lot of op optimism. Uh, they'll, ch they'll talk about some of the stuff going on in Washington and, and they'll kind of complain about it, but, but it, when it comes right down to running their business, they're still very, very optimistic and very confident. Now, I suppose if we keep talking long enough, we'll talk ourselves into some type of correction. That <laughs> seems to be what we do. But if you just talk to business people on the street today, while they hear that and it, it worries them a little bit, um, their fundamental businesses are doing very, very well. Renee? Yeah, uh, very similar. I mean, both in, in, the, in terms of the consumer um, uh, and on, on the commercial side, uh, you know, I think we survey our commercial customers. We've got the highest favorable rating about growth for next year um, since 2009. Um, so, so that all looks really well. I think, you know, we're in the Northeast and we, we, we go down to the Mid-Atlantic. Um, and really, uh, what we see is sort of a, a tale of two markets. Uh, so if you look at the large uh, urban areas, like uh, for us would be D.C., uh, Baltimore, uh, and then in real estate here in New York City, 
um, you know, you've got great population growth. You've got uh, since the, the time frame that you talked about, the last 10 years, we've seen about 14% growth in cumulative GDP in, in, in Washington, for example. Uh, in Northern Virginia, we've seen about the same in terms of um, uh, job creation. Uh, but if you flip that and go to some of our rural markets, um, while things are healthy and the customers that are there are very healthy, they're not seeing the same level of upside. So for example, over that same period, uh, if you look at upstate New York, or uh, Pennsylvania would be very similar, uh, that might be like 3.5% growth over that whole, whole period in terms of GDP. Uh, if you look at job creation, it's actually negative uh, five in some of these markets. And I, I mention that not, not because it's negative about the economy, but I think we have to watch uh, sort of as the political environment begins to change who's winning and who's not because those things tend to affect you know, the, 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 the political mood, uh, which of course, as we all know, affects us in a, in a, in a big way. Um, the one thing I'll say uh, about sort of those uh, urban markets, if you look at Buffalo, the amount of public-private partnership has produced growth that is on par with some of the large cities. And it's quite interesting to see actually uh, an area, a rural area, get this economic rejuvenation. So it is possible to, to sort of you know, get everybody to benefit, but, but I think uh, there's definitely a tale of two cities going on. Any thoughts on the interest rate environment? In interest rates? <laughs> I, I personally think that uh, <clears throat> rates are going to continue to go up uh, slowly. <clears throat> I think they should continue to go up slowly. Um, I agree with uh, Chair Powell, who said we're, we're not uh, near uh, equilibrium yet, uh, although one of the governors gave a speech yesterday, and one of the newer governors, and said we're almost at the neutral point. Uh, my, my own experience has been there's probably 150, 175 basis points to go before uh, interest rates become a determinate factor. Uh, people talk a lot about interest rates, but when business people get up in the morning, you know, until rates get to a pretty high level, that's not their primary consideration in terms of whether they invest money. There are many, many other things they have to think about. So and, until you get, you know, uh, rates up, um, you know, in, into the 5 6% range, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a determinant. And so, you know, we've got 150 or so basis points to go before I believe it'll even become a factor at all. And I think before it becomes a um, negative determinant, I think the Fed will begin to slow. So I think we see you know two or three rate increases next year and then a, a little bit the following year and then be, we begin to kind of you know get to a place where they go to the sidelines. I think clearly the near term movement, you know the market, our economists, and I'm sure all our economists say that they'll, that the rates will continue to go up because the economy's growing and they're trying to take the accommodation out and get the economy more resting on its own. And so I think that's pretty much everybody's base case. And they're going up for the right reason and that's what gets lost in the discussion. They aren't going up just because people are trying to push them up. They're going up for the right reason. The economy's growing fast yeah. enough that you can take the accommodation out. But I, I was thinking about this question the other day. How old would you have to be um, to have been working the last time you know, the Fed's funds rate was like 4% or 5% and you're starting to find it's 35 or older. Right. And so there is a, it'll be interesting to see this process through our companies when you think there's a lot of people who have never seen a Fed's fund rate above 3% mm -hmm. in their entire working career. And they're not two years in, they're 10, 12 years in now. And so you start to say, do they really understand that this is not, we've lived through abnormal. You're going back to more what you'd hope would be normal, where the economy is strong enough that a Fed's fund rate, a neutral rate above 3%, 3.5% would be yeah. you know, achievable, because that means we've got enough growth to have it there. And I, and I think it's just, it's hard to get people to think that question through, which is these are the lowest nominal rates. You can't punch them into the Blue Book terminal and get them to come out. I mean, you have to go back to times when the data wasn't kept to find them sustainably at this level. And, and people are acting like, well, my God, they're going up from one to two. You're saying it's one to two percent. Let's think about that. <laughs> or two, you know. yeah. It's a great point. So we may need a generational reset of expectations on what is a normal rate environment. Um, and speaking of expectations, uh, one of the things we see is customer expectations continue to rise. And for banks, customer expectations are increasingly being set by their experiences, not just within banking, but beyond banking. Um, 
Nandita, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Uh, how do you see those expectations rising and, and what, are you, what are you doing to respond? Yeah, that's a great question. So customer expectations are definitely rising and they are looking for immediacy and convenience right now. In fact, we and, and every banker feels this, uh, transactions are morphing from branches and going to mobile every day. Um, and if you look at it, you know, customers want immediacy and convenience because they are getting that from the right share companies and Amazons of the world. You know, five, seven years ago, we couldn't imagine ordering something and getting that the same day from Amazon. So as consumers, they're saying, why can't we send and receive money immediately? What's wrong with that? So I think the whole paradigm has changed, and I believe that we bankers have to change accordingly. And I'm very passionate about customer experience. I'm sure the others are too. And for us, we try to put the customer at the center of it all. And we look at it and we try to respond in many different areas, but I'll talk about three today. The, one, the first one is investing in design. You know, historically, digital was all about functionalities, content, who had better features. Well, those are commodities today. Today, it's all about the experience. The battlefield has gotten to design-centric organization, design-centric um, content. And that is where customers are being wowed and won. So design then becomes extremely important because that's what customers look at is less friction and ease of use and onboarding and so on and so forth. Connected to that, connected to design is the need for the right people, talent because this is a new breed of thinking. Brian was just talking about you know, us 35 plus or more. Um, we are the ones that remember what, what it used to be. right? So I'm not sure I'm the right person to be designing those uh, you know, interactive sessions that we want with our customers. So it's very important then to hire the right breed of individuals, to hire folks, especially millennials, who can come in and work those environments. right? So workforce and hiring the right people, making sure we empower them, we inspire them, we retain them becomes extremely important. You know, they talk about culture attracts people and they talk about leaders retain people. And the third area I would say, and probably the most important, is where we get feedback directly from the customer. And what do we do about it? How do we change our feature functionality, product design, product, products pricing, all of that based on customer experience and the feedback we get from them. I have recently appointed an individual, a lady, that reports to me directly and takes care of the whole enterprise payment experience or enterprise uh, customer experience. And that has made a huge, huge difference because they understand how important it is. And she, while she's not responsible for any one area, she is responsible for the whole enterprise. So uh, brings about uh, huge changes. And you know, latest JD Power scores had us as number one in California and number four in the country. So happy about that. Kelly? So, <clears throat> so when you're thinking about um, a lot of change, I think it's very important to establish perspective. Um, you mentioned paradigm. So if you go back over 55, 60 years in this country, uh, there's really been only one big time paradigm shift. And that was coming out of World War II, there was a real demand in retail America for more time convenience. If you think about prior to that, all retail America was in right downtown. You had the hardware store, the post office, and the bank, and, and there was no parking, and there was nothing. It was just what it was. But all of a sudden, the public started demanding more convenience of time. So retail America invented suburban shopping centers. Banks went right along. We said, we'll build a building out there. We'll give you plenty of parking. In fact, we'll, we'll throw in a drive-in window in case it's raining. You won't have to come inside. And the public said, well, that's pretty good. But on Friday night, you know, we might want to get some money at 8 o'clock. So we said, fine, we'll put an ATM in the wall. Yeah. They said, well, that's pretty neat, but we don't want to carry all this cash. So we said, we'll give you a debit card. And then they said, we want to check our balances at home in the bedroom. So we'll give you an online bank. And so we've been through all these changes. But it's all about one simple paradigm, convenience. Uh, and so it's important to recognize what has changed and what has not. Now, until very recently, what did not change was the trusting relationship between the banker and the client. So as long as you could reasonably meet the te technological convenience requirements uh, and you had a really good trusting relationship, you won the game. Now what's happened in the last two or three years 
uh, and this is to the credit of Brian and some of the very largest other banks, um, th there's been a shift in the definition of quality, at least in my view. Historically, quality was defined as technology in the back room and interpersonal relationships in the front room. About three years ago, this shifted. And now quality is defined as a function of technology in the back room, of course, but more importantly to the client, technology in the front room. And I still want that trusting relationship also. So it's gotten more complex. So now what you have to have is you know, all of the technological requirements in the back room to be efficient in the front room to meet the time demand, but you still have to have that interface when the client demands it. The final thing I'll say, and this is, is just the way I frame it in my own mind, uh, over the last few years, there's been this acceleration of this, uh, this demand for convenience, and it's what I call demand for real-time satisfaction. Clients want it right here, right now. They typically hold up their, their, their mobile phone. I want it right here, right now. Now, we're all scrambling really, really fast to accommodate that and doing a really good job of it. <clears throat> we can talk about later, but some impending issues around that are security issues. Uh, but this is all about changing the paradigm with regard to convenience, and it's important to remember that so we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thanks, Kelly. Renee, what, uh, part of the technology paradigm shifting mm -hmm. is also the potential for banks to use the power of data mm -hmm. to engage and personalize customer experiences. Any thoughts on that and the, and the role that's playing? In, in meeting rising customer expectations. Yeah, uh, I mean, let me just sort of start off where I love Kelly's explanation of, of what the banking industry has gone through because we've done a lot of innovation which is generated from within. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of talk about banks sort of being behind and catching up was uh, a matter of circumstance. We were in the crisis. We were building, uh, building risk systems. We were doing all those things right at the time where the confluence of, uh, you know, six decades of, of the computer revolution, microprocessor four generations, um, broadband starting to expand, um, it, it was a point where um, not only were we occupied with other things, but we had a reputational issue. And those two things combined were a big deal. But when I look at it, I think we're incredibly positioned. So when you kind of get down to uh, this idea of you know, what's the importance of data, what's the importance of technology, I think the better question kind of goes to where Nandita was, which is uh, in other industries, they don't talk about those two things. They talk about technologists and data scientists. And it, you know, there is no technology, there is no data without those two, those two individuals on your team. And what I think uh, is, is going to be most instructive is that we're going to have to rethink the way we, we go about hiring talent. And if you go all the way back to the crisis, why that was so important from a reputational standpoint is not only because we had a, better, a lower reputation with our customers, but with talent. And my, my sense is that we're going to have to do a much better job. So if you look at our shop, we have uh, uh, 1,250 roughly technologists. And as we look out to 2025, we will need to almost double that when you look at technologists, data scientists, customer experience individuals. So uh, you can you picture yourself um, uh, trying to tackle a customer problem, and you say, well, this is great. You know, at M&T, we got 112 data scientists. Well, the data scientists aren't any good without the other, other, other folks. And, and if you think about it, for many, many, many years, our entire institutions have been set up to develop and issue products as opposed to solve customer needs. So as you begin to bring in the new talent, make it attractive, you also have to figure out how to reform the way in which our, our back office processes work, the way in which we approach uh, innovation and collaboration. And so um, you know, data is central to it, but if you actually start to look at those teams, and the teams are going to be what, what's going to differentiate you. It's going to be what allows you to get to the next innovation. Um, you know, they're just one part of the puzzle in my mind. Uh, so really, really, really important. Uh, we have a history of, of, of data being needing large amounts of investment to go from where we were to where we are. Uh, but to me, it's really about the teams and, and the talent. Terrific. Um, Brian, we've heard uh, several mentions already of the need for real-time satisfaction, real-time experiences. Uh, the industry is obviously in the middle of much investment and activity on real-time payments. 
Um, talk a little bit about innovation and real-time payments as you see that evolving. Well, I, th I think, you know, Jim and the team have been driving this and we're, we're, we're operating and we, it's, up, it's not a theory, it's not a question, it's up and operating and stuff's going back and forth and we're getting more and more people enabled on it. But the question is why do you need it? And what you really need is um, you need a cash equivalent that has a finality of cash, a convenience of cash, and has the real-time ex monetary exchange and the people know they're paying and they know they're getting something. And that's a key element to it to get the system to run as well and also have it available in a ubiquitous nature. So I think, I think we think this is a real next generation for the convenience so the person can basically, basically it's, you know, if you combine all this and think about it, it's redefining, to Kelly's point, the checking account to the debit card to the ATM to get cash out. Now you're just finding another way to access your real account and really pay for stuff where a person can get the value and know that they're getting the value instantaneously and paying it back. The problem is all the other clearance systems we've had have been a delay. So somebody had to trust somebody in there and comes in the, you know, the MasterCard Visa system and guarantees. This allows the micropayments to take place. And so you can't use any one of these, but the security of it with the tokenization and all the things that going on, the convenience of it with the wallets that we've all operationalized, the real-time nature of it and the movement, the, the P2B and the, B, the P2P and the Zelle and all the things, all this works together against the convenience of the customer and frankly, security and convenience of the customer and then frankly, um, on the other side, an ability for us to actually move cash. You know, in the end of the day, you know, we still are spitting out a half, a, a $250 million over the teller line every day and $250 million out of the ATMs every day in a quote, a cashless society close, we're not, we're so far away from this, you know, and yeah, the transaction volume's going down, but the dollars are still going up. And so, yeah. you know, and so this is for all of us, it's, it's security, it's convenience to the customer, but for us, it's cleaning up the rails and making them operate much more effectively. And, and don't forget that definitiveness of I bought and you sold will help us get, deal with a lot of these issues go on where we're caught in the middle arbitrating between two people who had an exchange that because of the mechanisms are asking us to arbitrate it. And we, at the end of the day, we don't need to, we shouldn't be doing that, that's not our role. And I think, so I, I, I have high hopes for it. We're seeing it operate, and Jim and, and Russ and the team, you know, we're able to collect it. And this is something we have to do as an industry, and it, it's gonna be available to everybody. It has to have a network effect, like Zelle, like this, like, everybody has to get it. And by the way, we have to do it for free for the customer. So there's no idea we're gonna charge for anything. It's just, and the idea is we have to then make it a core part. It's the checking account of the future. I think that's, those of us are in this session, I don't know, four, three years ago, you know, somebody said, I forget who it was, it may have been, uh, may have been Bob or somebody, everybody's predecessor said, this is just the checking account, isn't it? And we said, yeah. And that's, yeah. and everybody said, I got it, let's go. And that was it. Three years later, we're here, I think. Wonderful. Um, let's broaden the aperture from real-time payments and payments innovation to innovation more broadly. Uh, there is a lot of noise these days, we'd argue more noise than signal on fintechs. We estimate that in the last five years, nearly $60 billion in investment has flowed into, uh, into fintechs. At the same time, we see many of them struggling with challenges around the cost of customer acquisition without existing brands and distribution and those with more balance sheet intensive models with the cost of capital. Uh, Renee, maybe I'll start with you first on this one. Uh, as you think about fintechs, do you see them as competitors, partners, neither or both? Well, I think my short answer is both. Um, I think in, on the one hand, you know, the, the banking industry is well established. We've got tremendous amounts of scale, uh, significant resources, and we're trying to figure out how uh, to get to the convenience question and to, and to digitize you know, our, our way of doing business. And on the flip side, the fintechs have mastered that uh, and have one key ingredient, which is talent and skill, mm -hmm. right? Back to your earlier point. Right, back to the yeah. earlier point. And, um, uh, but they've yet to prove whether they can scale. And so in, in my mind, that's a bit of a, a, a marriage made in heaven, possibly, um, uh, because I, I think if you were to take a closed loop uh, on it, and we in the industry were to say that we had the best talent, and therefore we're gonna produce all the ideas, I, I think that would sort of be a death knell. Uh, so part of our job is to sort of open ourselves up in a way where we can share some of the mutual benefit to make sure that the industry survives. Having said that, if I kind of bring myself back into the industry, I, I do believe, you know, we, we all spend the same statistics. We probably spend eight to 10% of our, our revenue on technology. 
we spend you know 20 to 40 percent of that on innovation and new products and services. Um, for a bank our size, trying to, spending your time and spending those dollars to keep up is not a good idea. You really have to. We, our, our job, we really have to figure out how to differentiate ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that is that we can't afford to actually have large portions of our talent be outsourced. Because as we come up with those ideas, we have to, to, to the best we can, actually retain them in that same talent pool. So that's one of the reasons why I look at it as both. We've got to open ourselves up to it. If you do that, you'll also get the benefit of being an attractive place, an open place to be able to, to work. Uh, but I think internally, if we're going to see many more uh, of the things that we do outside actually come inside. Um, Brian, part of the incumbent bank response to the fintechs has been technology innovation of your own. Earlier this year, uh, B of A launched Erica, the chatbot, and more generally in banking and beyond, there's lots of talk about artificial intelligence. And back to Kelly's point, maybe that's a big part of bringing technology into the front room, not just the back room. Uh, what do you see as the future of AI, particularly in banking, and what are the kinds of experiences could it power? Well, I think <clears throat> we were having this discussion with the manager team yesterday. The, the word AI is, you know, you can make it this broad or this narrow, depending on how you do it. But it, to me, there's four or five technology things that we're trying to harness in the company, and I think all of us are, which is the capabilities of voice recognition have changed dramatically, the capabilities of uh, data storage and, and retrieval, you know, to be able to store the data and access it the ability to do the calculations on it, what most people refer to as artificial intelligence, and, and then the, the second set, which is predictions, and then the second set, which is machine learning when the machine learns itself. But most importantly, is a network to actually distribute it, both wired network and wireless, because at the end of the day, something like uh, Erica does not work if your network's so slow and your latency so long. So you have to have all those things line up. And then there's the customer-based uh, application, but also internal. Go to back to Renee's point about data scientists. If, if I can articulate what I'm asking for, I want to know who had green socks and came into the financial center on Thursday, and that can go all the way through and it query the machine and come back, I can save a lot of people. And that's not a very intellectual content to it. But it is a data inquiry. It is a, and a data scientist will have to produce the inquiry and stuff like that. So that you, you can also have tremendous inter internal capacity generation, whether it's statement spreading that we've used uh, robotics on, whether it's uh, 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 credit offer memorandum preparation, whether it's predictive modeling for other types of where we send the sales forces and stuff like that. But it all comes back from harnessing, I think, all five of those technology platform type plays and getting them going. And so we're learning a lot from the, you know, the voice recognition, artificial intelligence, because um, you can text in there, because not necessarily, you can do it either way, but we're learning a lot. We're learning a lot about the customer. We're feeding them insights about mm -hmm. their accounts. And you know it's way out there in terms of the day-to-day -day activities, but there's three or four, like four million people using it, and we're learning from them. Going to Renee's point about experimentation and the people using that are on the far edge of financial services, sort of artificial intelligence development, what it all means. Uh, but I think those four or five trends, in te those four or five aspects of technology, are compounding to to change the nature of everything we do, both internally and externally. And then if we put it against the what the you know going to Nandita's point earlier about you know, the ability, Alexa, Siri, et cetera, you have to keep up with the, the Joneses, not Renee, but all of Joneses, so to speak, and that you, you need to keep up, and you need to make sure that, you know, if people are gonna start talking to this phone and activating it or talking uh, and, and being able to compel the computing power of a supercomputer capacity in a direction, you know, and that's what they're gonna expect out of you because they can do that with, with some other facet of their life at warp speed and instantaneous and answer any question. We're going to have to do that in financial services, so that's where we're going. You know, so we're just we're pushing this out. There. We're proud of it. It's working, but we we think we still have a long way to go to learn from it. But in the end of the day, and I think all of us are learning from this. It's those four or five compounding effects of those technology platforms. It's not artificial intelligence on its own. It's not data. It's not networks. It's not voice recognition. It's not machine learning. It's going to be all those things. And then, how do you use them to enhance the customer experience and employee experience is going to be the trick. And and you know, we're taking a bold approach in some cases, but a lot of incremental, you know, just to speed things up, make things a little bit better, and then figure out where it goes next. You know, <clears throat> you know, to me, this is one of the reasons I am the most optimistic about our industry than I have been in my entire career. Mm -hmm. for, for much of my career, I feel like we have been on defense. You know, if you go back over 30, 40, 
years, we saw ourselves, the banking industry, substantially lose control of the lending business. You know, when I first started, the banks in this country made about 80% of all the loans before we went into crisis that dropped down to 30. We saw ourselves getting substantially disintermediated by the money market funds that took huge amounts of our deposits out because we ended up having to bail them out in the, in the crisis. And we were on the cusp of losing the payment system. But with the great work that Jim and others have been done recently, I think we're reclaiming ownership of the payment system, which is really, really huge. But there's a frontier uh, that relates to this whole area of information and AI uh, that is extremely exciting. And that is really we are all in the business of information management. We know more about our clients than anybody. Amazon knows a lot. We know a lot more. And so if we can harness AI and other forms of machine learning uh, and figure out ways to offer solutions, not just around the speed of convenience, which I alluded to, but around the, the quality of that movement of activity, uh, which we can do. The tools are there today. Uh, the need is there today. There's nobody else that is well suited to handle that uh, as well as us. Now, if we wait a long time, somebody will figure it out. Amazon or somebody will figure it out. But there, for the first time, to me, there is a huge new opportunity uh, for us as an industry to forge a new primary uh, anchor point with the client. And that is about helping them manage the information they need in their life to live comfortably, conveniently, uh, with security. Nobody can do that like we can. And, and so the thing about that, and that's just playing off of what uh, Kelly said, the insights out of Erica are telling people they're spending too much or spending too much. That's just a real-time budget management exercise. And so if you go back generations ago, that would have been balancing your checkbook. And I, I venture to ask who's balanced their checkbook recently in this crowd. Even with a bunch of bankers here, I guarantee none of them have actually done it. You know? um, and so the point is, it's just, it helps people manage real-time. That, that isn't, to Kelly's point, that is entirely compelling. And we're not taking information and trying to sell it to somebody or use it. No, it's their information about them that we can analyze and compare them to people who might look like them, that they don't know who they are, and say you're spending more than the people in your cohort, just like you know, MyFitnessPal will tell you you have more weight than people in your cohort, whatever. And that, that real-time intimacy that the technology enables you to have and the insights you have from the data, and the ability to use it for the customer, I think, I agree with Kelly, gives you an extremely optimistic view of where this goes over the next decade for our industry. Uh, as opposed to you know being product suppliers along various dimensions that is you know gone in the past now. Um, you all touched on uh, the rise of of technologies um, and the deployment of technology platforms. When we look at the technology sector as an example, we see the rise of real large scale players. Um, and and outside the U.S., if we take China as an example, even more stunning, right? Uh, customer bases of 800, 900 million. Um, and that scale story seems to be playing out across different industries. Uh, so as you step back and think about it for banking, maybe we'll do a quick CEO round robin here, starting with you, Brian. What do you see as the role of scale in banking uh, and, and the implications for, uh, for banks of different sizes? Well, I think, you know, I think it's, it's important because it gives us a chance to offer a convenience that um, the customer gets a benefit of, and I think Interesting enough and appropriate for this room in this, these, these groups, whether it's BPI and the clearinghouse, there's different scales. There's scale that we have in Bank of America on our own. There's scale that we share with the industry as an industry, real time as a case. Zell, you pick that. And so we need to use scale for the industry's benefit and the individual's benefit, what we're doing in some of the cybersecurity work with bits. What we're doing. So you go down all these things. And so it is critically important. And I think the thing is the actual institutions have to drive the scale equation. Um, with all credit to the great service providers over time that provide us, whether it's you know, in, the, in the back office stuff, because right now the aggregate of these institutions just in the clearinghouse is so much bigger than any third party supplier to them that we, we have to think about how we help those people either get up to speed or build what we need as a utility. And that's one of the fun things I think we've, we've all gotten into over the last you know, five, seven years with the EWSL transformation, real-time transformation, tokenization is how can we bring, scale is important, but how can we bring scale together as a, as a communal group and then make it available to the entire industry? Really going back to the thing that we have this unique view of the right thing to do with customer convenience, security, safety, trust, that I think will be better for the customers. We firmly believe that. 
but sometimes we have to own that scale and sometimes we have to borrow that scale. Right. Sometimes we have to create that scale and I think that's the interesting thing. And the interesting thing is when we think of our banks as big banks, you know, using your China, you got to remember that we are the second largest market cap in the world. We're the fifth largest earner in banking. JP's number one in market cap, we're number two. You got to remember, the four Chinese banks are bigger than any of us and earn more than all of us. So everybody goes to Ant and Alibaba and stuff. Those banks are huge banks too. So there's a competitive set that's going to be interesting over the next couple of decades with what happens with those large, you know, it's a $10 trillion institution with one major shareholder. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So we've got to have some scale ready to go. Thanks, Brian. Nandita? It's a great question. Um, I uh, agree with Brian in terms of the creating the scale and how we as industry partners can get together to do that. Earlier today, I heard from someone that when asked who's your bank, they said Venmo. So talk about um, the FinTech being a competitor, uh, but then talk about us coming together and coming up with a, uh, with a solution and reclaiming that space, as Kelly said, with Zell. Um, but when it's so absolutely agree on scale can be created as we partner together with uh, under the uh, leadership of uh, TCH. But then we at Bank of the West also enjoy another type of scale. We are a part of our affiliate of the fifth largest publicly traded bank in the world, not um, those uh, the Chinese banks are, um, of course, owned by the government. And we have the front row seat as a result of watching a lot of things that are going on. Innovation, risks, cyber, um, different ways of management. Um, so um, absolutely scale matters. And that can be either created or borrowed. In our case, we borrow it too. So scale is a big deal. Um, I think it is changing pretty quickly. Um, in terms of the backroom scale technology over the last few years, and Brian alluded to this, is there have been some positive changes in terms to smaller banks being able to access scale through uh, plug and play types of uh, uh, requirements, uh, through shared utilities, through industry uh, collaboration. And by the way, I want to congratulate Brian, because you all wouldn't have a way of knowing this, but he has been a real leader in terms of us working together as an industry in terms of uh, you know, finding ways to economize and make ourselves more effective. So thank you, Brian, for that. Uh, there's a whole other area, though, with regard to scale that is something I think we all have to be concerned about. Uh, and this is a pretty recent thing, too. And that is, today, scale with regard to marketing is a whopping big deal. As I said before, you know, the, the definition of quality has changed. So quality is now defined by the client as just that personal relationship, but a really big issue in terms of technology. But it's also changed in terms of their perceptions, and perceptions are substantially managed by information um, uh, that, they are, that, they are, that they perceive in the marketplace. And so, and I give them credit, but the largest banks today are putting billions and billions of dollars very effectively into marketing. Uh, and it is swaying opinion, and it is swaying decisions, swaying beha behavior. And so one of the challenges that all of us, and I would say a company our size, which is not that large, but we are the eighth largest U.S. bank, bank um, meeting the challenges of scale with regard to marketing is a whopping big issue. So I think we can find ways on the back room through shared utilities and plug and plays and things like that that mitigate somewhat the effect of scale. But this marketing scale issue is something every one of us needs to find a way to tackle. And my humble opinion is the answer to that is differentiation. Thanks, Kelly. So yeah, I mean, scale has always been um, key. Uh, we're in a commodity business. We're a financial intermediary. And if you can't be extremely efficient, uh, you know, your chances of surviving for a very long time, I think, um, are, are low. Uh, but there's been lots of folks in the industry and lots of institutions that have had actual, uh, you know, great efficiency, been very, very effective, but the whole game didn't work out. And in my mind, that is because we're risk managers. And we can think about risk managers in a very, very traditional sense, or we can maybe go to some of the topics that, that we've all been working on, which is, you know, what are our biggest risks? And when you start thinking about things like cyber and the fact that, um, you know, uh, for a little M&T, we're not just uh, up there competing and worrying about risk in Buffalo, we actually now are part of the system and have to worry about that global risk. And um, I love uh, the description that Brian had because uh, you know we're we're the small fish when you when you bring it up a level to, in, in terms of nations, 
And um, the collaboration is so important to be able to figure that out. Um, when you think about uh, the work that we've all done on, on BSA AML, um, I, I would assume for all of us, it's been extremely clear as we've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on our own individual systems, that when we uh, leave work and we go to dinner with the, the individual who runs the community bank, you can't help but look at that individual and say, well, geez, now they're just gonna come to your place, hmm. right? So this, this issue, a bigger issue of, of using scale around Brian's topic uh, uh, for the US and for our system as a whole, I think is gonna be the most critical issue out there. Uh, collaboration with the government is gonna be essential as well. Yeah, that's a great observation on uh, defense because we've spent a lot of time talking about offense in a sense, but I think we all in this room appreciate that fundamentally banking is a people and technology enabled risk management business. Um, Kelly, uh, any more thoughts building on Renee's points about cyber and fraud and what the industry is doing to manage? For sure, we should never have a, a group discussion of two or more people without talking about cybersecurity. <laughs> um, many of you have heard me talk over the years about the biggest risk we face. Uh, you heard me several years talk about EMP, electromagnetic pulse. It is still the singular most important risk we all face, but it is the probability is lower. I will tell you now that the number one risk we all face is cybersecurity. It's interesting, over the years, we've all learned as bankers that credit is the only thing that can really get you. And that's kind of true on a long-term basis. But you can't, you gotta try really hard to mess up a bank real fast with credit. You can do it over a period of time. Any one of us can lose our institutions overnight with cybersecurity risk. And collectively, we can lose the industry. And we can lose the country over cybersecurity risk. Now, I don't want to frighten if those the cameras back there are recording this. I don't want to frighten the American public today that I believe we're getting ready to have a major cyber attack and, and put the country at risk. I do not, because there has been dramatic improvement in terms of cybersecurity led by the banking industry. Over the last 10 years, our industry has moved to the forefront. We are the leading sector uh, with regard to cybersecurity risk management, uh, and we have mitigated the risk dramatically but at the same time, I think you all know the, the, the offense has increased dramatically and continues to increase dramatically every single day. And so we have to be sure that we are individually and collectively investing substantially financially and human resources, uh, and especially working together collectively to make sure our, our mitigation, risk management, defense mechanisms are the best they can possibly be. We can do it. We are doing it, but we must remain absolutely committed to that uh, on a consistent daily basis. Uh, I applaud TCH and BPI. Our BITS committee is doing a fantastic job. Chris uh, Feeney's in the room. Uh, but please, in your institution, because we are all in this together, this is not competitive. If you don't have it raised to the highest level, please consider doing that. Uh, and then anything you can see that you can do working together with the industry, uh, give it your top priority, because that's the one risk that we cannot allow to be taken for granted. Thank you, Kelly. We have several questions from the audience, so perhaps just to close out the discussion here, uh, and perhaps looking forward on an optimistic note, I'll ask each CEO uh, to share either one big opportunity for banking over the next decade, or one prediction for banking in 2025. What might this panel in 2025 be talking about that we're not talking about now? Nandita, I'll start with you. Okay. Well, I think the opportunity for banks is that um, we should be a lot more involved in corporate social responsibility. I think we owe it to our customers and we owe it to our employees to be much more engaged in uh, sustainable finance. Uh, we recently have done that and talk about uh, distinct marketing advantage and that definitely is providing us that. In terms of prediction, well, I'll be a little flippant, and I would say that I hope we bankers take our he heads out of the clouds and actually invest our businesses in the cloud. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Kelly? Uh, so I, um, I think the greatest opportunity for our industry uh, is to help the world understand who we are and what we do. We do really good work. 
uh, and especially the last 10 years, it has not been very well recognized. In fact, to the contrary, the truth is we have been beaten down uh, and been put in a light that would suggest that we are not a real positive contributor to the economy. The furthest uh, is from that is the truth. We help grow the economy. We create jobs. We support the educational system. We're the first in line for the March of Dimes uh, March every year. We, we do really good work. We support the communities, and yet we need to do a better job of letting the public know the good work that we do. And one thing I would suggest you think about, uh, I believe the way to do that is to raise the question to a higher level. And the higher level is to think in your institution uh, and to help the world think about why are we here? Why are we here? There's a great book, if you've not read it, called Man's Search for Meaning, written by Viktor Frankl. Frankl survived the Holocaust, spent three years in Auschwitz, wrote this book about his experience. And in this book, Frankl says, if you know your why, you can endure any how. In other words, if you're clear about your purpose in life, you can figure out how to deal with the obstacles. We have a really important why. We have a really important purpose, individually and collectively. If we can raise that to the public level, and let people know, let the world know, let Congress know why we are here, then five years from now, 10 years from now, we'll be operating in an entirely different level. The world will understand the powerfully important role that bankers and the banking industry play. Thank you, Kelly. Renee? Uh, I hate to go with the flow, but it's, it's three things. Reputation, reputation, and reputation. Um, I agree with everything that, that Indeed and, and Kelly said. I think the thing that makes me the most encouraging, encouraged is the level of collaboration that, I, that, that I've witnessed since about 2010. Uh, much, much higher than it's ever been. And somehow I think if, if we can begin to look at each other um, in a different light, um, you know, we're, we're really competitive. We do that really, really well. It's been a consolidating industry. It's just, we wake up every day to do that. But part of the whole process of getting yourself in that space of building a reputation and working with your community is sort of surrounding your entire life uh, uh, and day with that same type of behavior. So when I look at the industry, I think there are a lot of uh, common threats that have been pulling us together. And I think there's a lot to learn from doing more on, on, in that space. Thank you, Renee. Brian? Well, in 2025, it'll be, the, it'll be in the sort of the 40th year of working in this industry, around this industry, and there'll still be consulting firms telling me that financial centers won't exist 10 years <laughs> then. <laughs> and they will still exist um, because at the end of the day, it's back to really what Kelly said. There, we need high tech and high touch, and the way that we live the why is actually through that personal interaction. Now, we're finding better ways to make that is live in the digital space, as Nandita was talking about, as we are in a personal, in the face-to-face -face space. But in a day, we, we come to life to serve people through the people. And, and you know, so that, that's, that won't change. But the reality is it will be different. There'll be more technology. Customers will behave in different ways. We'll figure it out. But at the end of the day, it'll still be back to that question as optimistic, which is a thing that we have to take care of and nourish is the fact that customers need us to help them do, to achieve what they want in their life. And if we don't forget that, we'll be fine. Thank you all for that inspirational round robin. Um, I, I do have a few questions from the audience. Uh, Brian, we'll stay with you for the most popular question. You spoke eloquently about the opportunity for real-time payments. Uh, we'd underline that by noting that the US this year will write more checks than the next 50 countries combined. Uh, the audience question is, what is the biggest impediment that you see to the adoption of real-time payments here in the U.S.? It, it all comes down to behavior change. You know, I, I, it just, it's literally getting people to change, and, and that takes time, and so you've got to be invest way ahead of the tipping point. So, um, you know, it just, if you analogize it to something like deposits, you know, we took, you could deposit an ATM when I was in high school. You come out, you know, 40 years later around numbers, and we have half the checks in the ATMs, 25% of the mobile phone. The 25% of the mobile phone came up in six years. 
Yeah. So the pace of change, but it still takes that change to happen. It's still only 25% and still 25% go through the branches. So I think the real time will have the same analogous thing. So we're seeing Zelle take off and grow 100% a year and becoming interesting numbers. It's still, when you sort it out as a percentage of all the payments made is low. So we have to be patient with real time. And it'll just take getting people to understand how it will work for them and how it will help them in terms of their day-to-day -day life, in terms of you know, paying people, and the more the itinerant payment than the, you know, the sort of, a t that's the, the idea is it can be at any amount, any time, any amount, and initiated, you can make it a push. You, all these things that we've been theorizing about is a way that you can pay that gym membership that they actually have to check to make sure you still want to pay it. There it is. Yet, when you're standing in front of the person, you can, you can give it to them. So I, I think it's got great, but I think the issue is can we get customers to understand you know, ultimately how to use it to their thing, and that's going to get in the, the receiver side, whether it's a person or a merchant, and a sending side, whether a consumer out of their account or a business out of their account coming together. It, but it's always customer adoption. We just have to be patient to let it build relentlessly. Business to business, it'll happen instantaneously because anything that speeds up how fast I get my money is easy to explain to people. Consumer is just a hard, it's, you know, 300 million people out there. We've got to get to understand the change, and that's going to take some time. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Kelly and Renee, let me go to you on this next question. Um, is the growing consumer sensitivity to privacy a threat or an opportunity for banking? Oh, it's a huge opportunity. Um, I am so excited that the uh, consumer is getting concerned about privacy. Uh, I think for a number of years we were heading down a dangerous path of uh, putting everything there is in the world to know about each other on every web page we can possibly put. Um, and I think the consumer has got to get a bit more savvy about the risk uh, with regard to putting information out in the public space. Uh, we can do the best we can do in terms of managing the privacy, but ultimately it's the responsibility of the consumer. We have to do a better job of helping the consumer understand the risk uh, and then what we can do to help mitigate the risk, uh, but then help them sh uh, share with us the responsibility of, of uh, providing that kind of information. I mean, ultimately, we want the, you know, make the world a better place to live. We want, pub, we want people to be able to be as open as they want to be, and that's a healthy thing from the overall spirit of the culture of the country, culture of the world. Um, but it can lose itself just like that if we end up with so much privacy concerns and privacy risk and actual profit, privacy infractions that people go inward and we go the other way 180 degrees and people won't share anything with anybody about you know, anything that's going on. So it's a great opportunity for us to help educate and to continue to build uh, the security measures into our system. And I'm proud of our industry. I think we are on the lead uh, in terms of providing that type of forward-looking risk management. Renee, anything yeah. you'd add? Uh, I, I agree. It's a huge advantage. I, and I think um, the, there's a, you know, we're right at a, a turning point. Uh, just looking at the events that have happened um, around Facebook and some of the other providers of information, they couldn't be clearer and broader examples right, that are educating the entire public of, of the concern. Um, and then I think what, what makes me optimistic about it for the banking industry is that, I mean, all we are is our cultures and the cultures that we've built. And we've been built based on being very attentive to risk. Um, and some of the new cultures that are out there have been uh, uh, very attentive to a very good thing, which is transparency and openness, but have not exercised the muscles around the, uh, around the risk. So that shift, as the customer becomes more and more aware, it, there's several levels of benefits to us. But, but one is we understand how to help them. And the more we can find ways to help our customers, uh, you know, the, the better our reputation is and the better our purpose is. Renee, I'll stay with you on this next one, uh, and, and then Nandita would love to get your thoughts on this as well. Uh, Renee, you spoke quite poignantly earlier about a tale of two regions, even within your footprint. A uh, question from the audience is, what financial technologies or innovations are you thinking about that will better serve the underbanked? Yeah, I, I, I think it begins, I think one of the most instructive things, uh, if you think about what we talked about today, is, is if you look at what's happening at places like Square, um, where, you know, uh, we have presumed there are certain segments that we just can't bank. And in stumbling through a merchant exercise, they've realized by, by looking at data 
there are actually different ways that are non-traditional ways to begin to um, to begin to um, think about getting a, uh, getting paid back and banking I individuals in that space. Um, having said that, obviously it's a big threat, but in the sense, as long as we're able to learn from that and willing to actually do more experiments down that path, um, I think there's a number of things that we can actually do that, that we're actually looking on the outside and learning from. Um, I, for one, I can't really get into the whole thing, but I had an experience where I was educated in a space and then I started walking around my community and looking at people who were, who were underbanked using, using these services. And to me, uh, it made me feel like we were missing the boat. We have a particular neighborhood. Um, we define it by a zip code uh, in, in upstate New York. Um, and because of those trends, we sent out a number of individuals from our, uh, our consumer bank. And it was incredible to go into that community. Uh, and we started with, well, what do you think of M&T Bank? And they said, well, you know, the reputation was fantastic. And then we started thinking about our products and services. They said, well, we don't really use them because you don't really offer anything for us. But your reputation is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an eye opener because you can't get an answer like that unless you start de diving deeper into those communities and solving the problem. So I think we've got a lot of techno technological innovation that's sort of leading the way. There's clearly an answer here. Um, uh, and I, my sense is that we're, we're going to see more on that front you know, in the next year, two years. Now, is there anything you'd add? Yeah, I would say that it's a huge opportunity for us. Um, you know, at any given point in time, a third of the U.S. population is unbanked. And uh, if you talk to them, most of them will say they're intimidated by banks. So we have created that barrier somewhere, somewhere, somehow. And I would say very proud of Bank of the West. Years ago, much before I got here, we actually uh, got into a partnership with a community organization called Operation Hope, and we innovated it. Uh, we uh, we um, started it, and essentially what we have is individuals from the Operation Hope organization embedded within our branches. So if there are services that we cannot offer, or if we can give, need to provide them counsel, Operation Hope takes those from us. So I know that has spread quite a bit, but uh, very, very proud the fact that uh, Bank of the West got to offer that first. And really it is, uh, it's outreach and it's technology. With a mobile phone in the hands and the palms of practically every adult in this country, uh, banking services are just a few clicks away. And it's a question of having the right product set, having the right fee structure, having the right outreach, having the right education to bring them in the fold of banking. I mean, banking today, it's still a privilege. It should become a right. Well said. Uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, Brian, we opened with a macro question, so why don't we close with a macro question to you. Question from the audience. This morning sessions talked about the beneficial impact of technology in the financial sector. In the overall economy, however, productivity has remained low. Uh, why is this and how can it be improved? Um, <laughs> there was a wise person that said to me who knows far more about this and taught many of the people that we talk about today knowing about it said, we'll figure it out in 25 years. And, and it, you know, the measures and stuff change. And so, and I think it's a real struggle to figure out what, how to define productivity in the construct of what's going on in society. And so, in all, in all seriousness, and this was, a, this was a person who knows far more than probably everybody in the room combined on economics and things like that. Um, and so I think that that's really, we've got to be careful about looking for micro movements. The reality is, is we have a, a societal duty to figure out the question of the impact of technology over time on labor and, and, and people and how does it enhance our life and at the same time how do we make sure we uh, mitigate uh, the, ba the effects of it. And we spend a lot of time in our company thinking about how we change the company over time and how we plan for it in the future and how we try to mitigate those impacts. But, I, you know, I think the, the productivity conundrum from a monetary policy, current economic thing, I just, I, I don't, personally, when I have people describe it to me, I said, well, that isn't how you measure what really goes on anymore, you know, and so I think it'll take a while to figure out the broader, the different measurement systems, just like it probably took a while before. If you go to any company, they're doing more with less resources. It, that is across the board. And those are real companies talking to you. So I can't quite figure out the productivity debate when you go to every company. They say, no, we have 10 people doing what 12 people used to do. We have, and some of it's robotics, and some of it's, and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure the calculations work as well. But the broader societal question is, long term, 
from 50 years ago today, there's twice as many people working in, in the country. There's, it's down about 40% in manufacturing jobs. We had 75, 80 million jobs came in all around services. Mm -hmm. So in that area of lost manufacturing, we created 75 million more people working across 40 years. Just noodle on that question. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so the, the idea is this, will t this may take care of itself, but we have, to help, we have to help seed it and coddle to make sure it happens and quit getting worried about trying to debate whether we have productivity of 0.1 or 0.2 quarter to quarter. The question is long term, how do we deal with the impacts of technology on labor, on people, you know. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Nandita, Kelly, and Renee for a wonderfully candid, provocative, and inspiring hour.